I guess we've talked a little bit about summer crop. One of the, and, and, and that, that's always an opportunity when we get these breaks that we can take some of our, our country out to rapidly grow larger crops if we want to. Again, we've talked a little bit earlier about maybe just pushing the summer feed that's there, particularly if it's a reasonable quality grass, and thinking about that as a crop. And that's where we, you know, we talk about the Kaikuyu silage. One of the options that, that, that a really good break like this gives us is to take some country out of the picture completely as far as that rampant summer growth is concerned and think about preparing some stuff that might be more winter active. Because what we know with our summer active pastures is that once we start hitting a few frosts, okay, they tend to stop dead and they rapidly lose feed quality. All right? So they, if, we, if we have a requirement in winter for feed that's really going to grow cattle or put a lot of milk under cattle, okay, then having something more temperately orientated as part of our system can be really advantageous. So we, we talk a lot about, about the uh, annual options in this space and looking at some of the annuals. And we'll, and we'll touch on a few of these for the next five or so minutes just to talk you through it. Um, I like, I like annuals, you know, there's always some cost associated with setting them up, but they're generally very, very good at getting feed on the ground fast, okay, they can rapidly grow. And within the spectrum of annual options that we can look at, we can look at annual ryegrasses in that space, okay, but we can also look at cereals, so wheats, triticale, oats, barley, rye corn, and we've also got the option of some of the brassicas which can give us very, very quick feed. You know, we can get good feed up in front of cattle at this time of year in five to six weeks' time, okay? And at relatively low cost. Now, what that does a really elegant job of doing is it starts to fill a high-quality feed gap as our summer feed starts going off. We can also use it as part of a, re of, of a regeneration um, process. So annuals become very, very useful, okay, if we want to clean country up in preparation for new perennial pastures. So you can think about if I've got some dirty country, it doesn't have kike, it's just got junk, okay, lots of summer grass, why don't I just get rid of it, okay, and think about putting that into an annual. We do an annual sort of system as a cleanup, a simple crop where we know we can flick a bit of herbicide on if we want to take out weeds, all right? And then we take that out and that gives us a chance to take out these summer grass weeds before they all set seed, which they're right in the process of doing now, okay? and it starts cleaning it up because then if the following year is looking any good, I might want to put in a new perennial pasture in that space. So annuals are really good in this sort of regenerative cycle of cleaning up rubbish country because it gives us the ability to go in and, and spray country out but still grow feed and grow feed rapidly. I guess, you know, and, and it's less of an issue now that it's rained, we do a lot of work with guys on fallow systems, all right, where where, and, and a lot of my clients are down around Bega, and Bega can be a horrendously dry place, highly unpredictable when it rains, but the most likely time for us to get rain is in the autumn, okay? Uh, very similar to up here, probably not quite as much, but it's where our highest probability of rain is. And in that area, when we've got some larger farms, what we'll often do around Christmas time is completely take country out and kill it, all right? Kill all the growth on it and put it into a hard fallow. What that hard fallow does is it allows us to accumulate any rain that falls through January and February, and this is more in a marginal year, less of an issue now, okay, because then when we go to sow our, our annual or even our perennial pasture on it, not only have we got rid of the weeds, but we could well have accumulated two, three, four inches of rainfall in the profile. So then we get 30 mils in March and it goes dry. We're not just relying on that 30 mils in March that we got, we've also got water underground. So if you look at anyone that's doing serious cropping in the West, they've had all this rain out at Moree, I can assure you they're not watching the summer grass grow, okay? They're doing this exact same thing. And this is what we looked at in our dairy production systems, particularly in more marginal areas, is to say, let's look at fallow, okay? And let's look at moving moisture from when it falls to when we need it by not growing rubbish in the meantime. That's just something to think about as part of a portfolio. We've done it quite successfully here on a number of farms in marginal years. We had quite a bit of country fallowed out of, out of Trevor's this year. Okay, it rained anyway, all right? But had it not rained as much or as, as heavily, that might have accumulated two or three inches and it would have been ready there for us now to sow into. Planning and preparation is really important. Look, this is, here's just a couple of photos that I think are really interesting from Berger. This is, this is some country in the hills and you can see pretty dry year. This country was all allegedly sprayed out in, in, in the beginning of January, okay? Now, what happened, it was the young kid's first go on the boom spray, all right? <laughs> and you can see he missed some. Now, 
the interesting thing is that this had two sprays. This had one spray at Christmas, and it had a second spray immediately prior to sowing to kill the stuff that had reshot. This is the area that only had one spray. All right. So that little bit of moisture that we'd accumulated, okay, between the Christmas spray and the planting spray halfway towards the end of February, okay, it grew weeds here, all right, but where we'd taken it out successfully, this was the, the crop response, all right, extraordinary. Um, okay, just a few other things on annuals, okay, again, good competition control, so this is a nice mixed brassica and ryegrass crop, okay. This is where they miss with the competition control, all right? So it does become important. Just bang it in over the top of stuff that's germinating. We often see in a drought this sort of panic response when it rains, and we just start sowing, okay, because, oh, there's nothing there, okay? I can assure you there is stuff there. And if you don't have a little bit of patience on a break, all right, and wait for the rubbish to come up, that's what's going to happen to your crop, all right? This is a really interesting photo. This shows the importance of timing. Okay, they ran out of seed, two weeks later the seed came, all right? And that's the difference in timing when you, when you are chasing of two weeks, all right? So that's going to make about, a, that, or that's already made on an annualised basis in a beef system probably a 20% different to that paddock yield by being two weeks late. Okay, so timing, when the time's right and you're prepared and organised, getting it in the ground is really important. I'll show you a bit more of this photo, but this is just a photo of some co-plantings when we're actually mixing two sorts of pasture together at the same time. So this is cereals mixed with ryegrass. Okay, this is this is Warhope. Okay, and again, this is just a really lovely early sown pasture. Yeah, there's a bit of irrigation, but this year we'll do this anyway. So this is just a mixed brassica, cereal, and ryegrass pasture, giving extraordinary growth. And again, you know, there'll be a lot of beef operations that would be likely very happy to see this across a whole year. All right, this is six weeks regrowth. All right, and this just shows that if you want to go down a pathway of higher input farming and more intensity when the opportunities are there, we can ex achieve extraordinary yields of fodder very, very quickly. You know, average yields of fodder in both beef systems here, Pete, might be six tonne of dry matter per hectare, if that, somewhere between four and eight, you know, a lot more closer to four. This guy's already harvested on his by second grazing. Okay, across a 12-week period from when it was sown, it's already harvested six tonne. He's still got the rest of the year, all right? So if we are looking at an age where beef is a more valuable commodity and worth chasing, and I think we are, okay, and, and we are looking at more intensive systems, particularly finishing systems, this sort of system, if you want to start finishing steers, okay, becomes very viable. Steers will get onto this sort of stuff and they'll do 1.2, 1.6 kilos a day. All right, really, really good stuff. Um, all right, this is our photo of our little mixed planting. All right, this is just where we had ryegrass. This is where we threw in about 50 kilos of oats with it as well. All right, and if you're chasing feed, the addition of oats to the ryegrass is going to pretty much double or nearly triple the feed on the first two grazings. All right, low cost way of bringing more feed or winter feed into your system. Doesn't impact the ryegrass later in the year as long as you don't let the oats get too long. If they get too long, it can choke it out. So you've got to be prepared to utilise it. Cereals, okay. Are many people using cereals here as part of their planting systems at all? Okay, yep. Yeah. All right, this really, really handy. Okay, they grow very, very quickly. There's a whole range of types. And it's actually important that we don't think about cereal sowing as a generic issue because there are different varieties. Okay, we can look at wheat, for example. Have you, have we, has anyone heard of winter wheats? Okay and spring wheats, okay, all cereals will have a similar attribute. And what that basically refers to is a need to undergo what they call vernalisation. Okay, vernalisation is being exposed to very short day length to initiate seeding. A spring type doesn't need to vernalise, a winter type does need to vernalise. So winter wheats need to go through the shortest day of the year, effectively, to start seeding. So what we do if we sow early, we chase cereals that have got winter habit. Yeah, okay, because you don't want a cereal that when you put it straight in, it'll go straight to seed. Okay, that's a big pain, and particularly in a beef operation where you might be sowing a lot of country, right? So you might have been sold a bit of yarn oats, for example. Okay, yarn oats is a good example of a spring top. You put yarn in and you do a big planting of yarn because it was cheap, all right, at the beginning of the season, you turn around and you haven't got over and it's all gone to seed in about, in about a month. If you go to an older, another variety like Black Butt or your Rabbi, okay, or if you look at your wheats, things like Wedgetail, 
okay, or Naparoo, they're winter habitats. You can sow those early and they're much less likely to bolt to seed. So for early plantings, if you're doing cereals, chase stuff with winter habit. Later plantings, it becomes less important. Right. There's also some other stuff on oats in particular with, with soil temperature. There's a number of oat varieties when you're planting in hot soils that have been bred in Queensland and, 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 and more temperate parts of the US, which have got much more tolerance of warm soils. Um, okay, a little bit there just on sowing rates. If you need more feed quickly, increasing seeding rate when you've got plenty of moisture will give you more feed quickly. Makes no difference at the back end of the year, okay, but at the front end of the year, higher planting rates of, of, of most forages is going to give you more yield if you really need the feed. If you're patient, you don't need to feed the feed quickly. Back end of the season, you're not going to see a lot of difference from those higher and lower planting rates because plants have the ability to tiller out, okay. But if you're chasing feed front end, higher planting rates will give you more. And again, just this issue of timing, when's late, it's too late, you know, this, this is just some real data from down around Wagga, I think Josh just came out of a few years ago. Okay, so in the beginning of May, they grew three tonne in winter. Halfway through May, it's only two weeks later, they grew three tonne less, okay? And this is a relatively late in the year. So you can imagine the differences of sowing in late March compared to May, all right? It's huge across the year. Okay, perennial pasture options and considerations. These are some really important points that we'll just touch on. We can't go into detail on all of them. But preparation is key. Weeds are the enemy. Okay, and in particular, you need to try and take out summer annual grasses. Okay, because these are the, probably the biggest threat to new perennial pastures, either perennial, either temperate or subtropical. There's a massive germination of crabgrass the next year. Okay, so it's really important that you have something at the front end that's either taken out growing grass before it goes to seed and sets seed. Okay, or yeah, you're taking it out as seedling and going for an active summer fallow process if you're going to do sowing in the autumn. Moisture is king, okay, this year it's not short, but plenty of years it is, okay, so thinking about fallow systems if you're serious about putting money into perennial pastures is probably important, okay, because again, if we haven't, if, you know, because it can go dry quite quickly and can warm up a bit in, in, in autumn, all right, um, if it does, if we've got moisture under the ground and we've already got our little plant, it'll work its way down into that moisture for quite a while and it'll keep it alive. Timing is everything, and again, I don't think we need to go too early. You know, you want to be avoiding when you're sowing new grasses, new temperate grasses in particular. If you're looking down the forecast in the next 10 days, you're seeing days much above 30 degrees, I'd back off. Okay, I wouldn't go rushing in. But once you're seeing a run of weather where it's under 30, I think if you can get your, your grasses in at that time, you're still going to have really nice soil warmth to get a bigger plant, a stronger plant going into winter. Okay, but if we've got a bunch of 30s to 35s coming, I'll just keep away because that's when you fry grass. You fry grass during emergence is one of the key issues as it's coming from when it's popped out of the seed to when it gets to the soil. Match your species and cultivar selection for your region and expect a normal rainfall. So again, this comes back to strategy, okay? And understanding what your region is, your strategy is, and am I planting a sensible plant for my region? You know, we used to grow a lot of perennial ryegrass in areas like this and, and wonder why it didn't persist much more than 12 months. It's because it's a square peg in a round hole, okay? It grows beautifully in Tasmania. It might survive up on way on the tops of your tops here, but you know, perennial ryegrass is just not going to be a big play. It hates being above 35 degrees, okay? Understand your soil chem and do some soil testing before you put in. You know, people will put $20,000 into seed without doing a soil test. It doesn't make sense to me, okay? That information from a soil tester says, well, I've got lots of acid and a really low pH, okay? Well, I probably would value some lime or maybe I shouldn't be planting lucerne, which is highly sensitive to those two things, okay? So, you know, if you're going to invest in pastures, a little bit more knowledge on your soils makes a big difference. Weeds, know your enemy and work around them, okay? And this, this is really important, okay? We see lots of people go in and they plant chicory and plantain, okay, in, in areas where they might have a huge thistle problem. Right. Now the problem once you get into some of those herbs as part of your pasture strategy, it's really, really hard to control broadleaf weeds. All right? And if you know you've got a lot of broadleaf weed buried in there, you're setting yourself up for a bloody nose if you can't, if you can't actually control those up post emergence. We've got a few options with chicory in particular, okay? but not necessarily with thistle. Thistle gets really hard, but we can do that with a mower. All right? But the chicory we can use a chemical called broad strike, much more limited when we talk about plantains. 
Bugs, you know, if we know we have bugs and bugs are an issue, put a bit of money into getting your seed treated and think about some of those adjuncts when we spray out that give us a little bit of, a bit of control of, of, of insects as we move forward. But again, if we know we have a high probability of insects giving us a hard time, don't wait for them to chew it out. You'll see some great photos from Pete about that later. Okay, get in early and deal with it, particularly in new pastures. Um, and again, post-emergence, if you've got lots of weed, you can either control that very early or you can wait. <laughs> okay, and that's the options. This is what happens when you're controlling weeds during the seedling and establishment stage. This is what happens if you don't. Right? Same paddock, same the same time. This got a little bit of Tigrex about three weeks after germination. This didn't. Okay? 